All right. Uh, I'm Christopher Alberg. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Recorded Future. And as we get into the panel, I'm going to say a few words about Ukraine and intelligence. I like to say that uh, when it comes to oil, the pr in good intelligence about the price of oil might be more valuable than oil in itself. And I think we're now at a point where intelligence is not just guiding bullets. Intelligence might be the bullet in itself. The world is becoming internet-centric. And as we see here now, war is becoming internet-centric. At the beginning of the war, I sat in a room in our office in London with this very senior government official from Ukraine. He was showing me on his iPad movie clips that they were putting together, high production value movie clips for putting on to, to turn Russian soldiers, that they were putting on download sites, music sites, porn sites, to be on it. Uh, and it just told, told me, this war is becoming internet-centric. This is a new world here. We had worked early on with the Recorded Future in this sort of conversion between cyber security and, and warfare and disinformation, and that was sort of our raison d'etre. And so when we saw the war break out on the 24th of February, we were like, this is our time. We have to help out. So we declared loudly our support, probably as loudly as you could without sending a postcard to the dear Mr. Putin, and, and sent out our digital emissaries, and were then able to put, by now, I think, nine different agencies in Ukraine on our intelligence platform. And so what's been pretty interesting about this is that we've been able to do a lot of intelligence sharing and collaboration. Um, we've been able to, for example, right at the beginning, we had helped CERT UA to do a government-wide scan, sort of CISA uh, shields up like scan, if you want, uh, across the entire Ukrainian government network, found 10 very critical holes in, in it that the Russians couldn't have taken it, could have taken advantage of. We helped CERT UA likewise find holes as it related to Starlink and how they were communicating with that. We worked with NCC, their cyber coordination uh, uh, center, on finding issues around uh, critical infrastructure. The Ministry of uh, Digital Transformation helped them finding disinformation campaigns regarding the bio labs, and a series of these sort of examples. What I find compelling here, though, is maybe not so much the intelligence sharing. That's interesting and it's good, but what really ends up being interesting is how we can work together to share tradecraft on actually help them how to fish, nor to teach them how to fish, not just provide the fish. And that's how I think we can actually help Ukraine crush Russia, if I may put it that way. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dina Temple Rastin, who's the moder moderator of the panel. Uh, Dina is the, the executive producer of the Click Here podcast, and she's also a senior correspondent for the record by Recorded Future. Dina. Good morning. Thank you for coming. And uh, you may know my name from NPR, so if you feel more comfortable just sort of closing your eyes while I talk, <laughs> I understand. Uh, it's dark, so I can't tell. Uh, so let me introduce the panel to you really quickly. Uh, to begin with, uh, we're going to start with a discussion about cyber lessons that we can draw from Ukraine. So we have a panel that can kind of hit it in a lot, a lot of different ways. Uh, so first, we've got uh, Mika Oyang, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for, of Defense for Cyber Policy at DOD. I feel like we should applaud or something. <laughs> All right. There, thank you. Um, then we have Ole uh, Dirvianko, who is the Chief Vision Officer for ISSP, which is a Ukrainian cybersecurity company. And last but not least, uh, Gary uh, Steele from Splunk, which is an uh, analytics-driven cybersecurity firm. OK, so uh, Ole, I wanted to start with you because I wanted an all-Ukrainian panel, and I only get one Ukrainian. So I wanted you to tell us a little bit about what we might not be seeing just from a human level on what is going on in Ukraine right now. We, kn we know the electricity is out. Uh, we know that it's a, a, a tough slog right now. But what, what is the thing when you see us reporting about this that you think everybody's missing? Well, it's, it's, it's a hard question because first, probably this is the first, maybe not the first war, but yeah, maybe the first of, its, of that scale that, uh, that actually you can watch live. Like, almost like a reality show, right? 
unfortunately. Uh, but uh, maybe what you don't see is the, you know, that part of the resilience of Ukrainian people is the mood they have, the humor, the way they laugh, the way they joke, uh, you know, uh, and the way they support each other in, in, in every single moment of time, not just when something bad happens and then there's a, you know, an action needed, but also in small conversations, you know, in, in, in anything that needs to be done uh, in different ways. Yeah. So th th this is really, uh, I actually, you know, very often been asked for the last several months, you know, what has changed for you since the beginning of this full-scale invasion and uh, and I said, you know, operationally almost nothing has changed because we have, we have seen all these waves of cyber attacks before and they were at scale and uh, as, as well, you know, if you go back to 2015, 16, 17, you know, even from 2018 to 2020, there was a five-time increase in, in num num at least in the number of attempts, um, not, you know, less culminations, of course, but uh, so operationally almost kind of nothing has changed for cyber security service providers, but of course what has changed are all these different other, um, you know, constraints and pressures like logistical, especially the first two months, a lot of logistical issues and how you deal with families, you know, who is going to be relocated, what, what you do with your, because there are also the, the men and, and, and women in your company and you need to, so I mean lots of all, all these different things that you are not prepared for, uh, it, it, that you didn't have in your kind of formal uh, business continuity plans or uh, so, so it was, you know, kind of uh, action from, from scratch, like uh, on the go was needed and very quick decisions and so right. on. Right. And, and that's sort of what I wanted to get to more broadly on the cyber sphere when it comes to lessons learned from the Ukraine, from Ukraine, sorry. And, and we just uh, dropped a, uh, an episode of Click Here in which we looked at um, a cooperative of, of a collaborative of companies known as CDAC, um, Splunk is part of it, uh, that is basically helping various companies sort of build that resilience in Ukraine. And one of the things that they hadn't been, Mandiant hadn't been prepared for with math, Nafta Gas, which is the major oil and gas company there, was they seemed to be seeing these insider threats and they couldn't understand because the perimeter was closed, mm -hmm. uh, the perimeter of the network. And yet they were, credentials were still getting stolen and wiper malware was still showing up. And they were wondering, well, how are they getting through? And it turns out that as the Russians were advancing in different cities, they would actually take over data centers inside that, that were NAFTA gas data centers. So they looked like it was an insider threat because of that. So yeah. what the Ukrainians did is they would start to call their supervisors and say, I'm leaving now. And they would cut off their access and yeah. then the insider threat left. That was the case not just with NAFTA gas, but there were other companies uh, that uh, when, when the Russians uh, you know, took some territories, occupied some territories, of course they immediately got access to to, to the branches of those companies and it related you know, to, to telcos, to banking and so on. So, and many of them, of course, even if you cut a certain segment of, the, of your infrastructure from the, kind of, uh, from the other network, they still have access to, uh, to the uh, machines, right? So still, they still can learn a lot uh, and, uh, and it makes the further attempts and further attacks a little bit easier. Uh, for them, and but uh, frankly, those attacks that uh, that we saw, because because there was a huge increase in number of attempts, it always, you know, tricky how you count cyber attacks. You know, President Zelensky just recently said to Jade 19 that uh, there was you know 1,300 cyber attacks, but of course it depends how you count. You know, the cyber business you said was 166, so it's really whether you count all the network activity uh, or you just you know really look right. at some attacks that evolve. Uh, yeah, but um, but those uh, the, the the attempts uh, on, uh, on on Ukrainian critical infrastructure in most of the attacks that actually what we were so culmination the intrusion didn't happen during the period of war. Right. It was definitely before some so cases that were, some cases that we saw they, they took us. If you remember, there was a big wa a, you know a wave of, of cyber attacks in mid January this year. And, and also December and October last year. Uh, sometimes when you investigate the attack, you could, you, I mean, you know, you're, you're 
earliest event is the one that you can actually detect, right, <laughs> and trace back. So in some cases, we saw that we clearly see that the intrusion at least happened in January, but it doesn't mean that you know could be easily that it happened even happened. before. Uh, and uh, what we see also what has changed recently, like even like for the recent months, even if you compare this you know third quarter to second or first quarter, uh, is that. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, you know, Russia's not hiding anymore. So if you look at those attacks and back in 15, 16 and all the other years, you typically would see that CNC centers, command and control centers would be located, I don't know, in Netherlands and France and States, you know, you name it. But now we have like, uh, you know, many of the attacks just coming directly from the Russian AP addresses. So they, they don't kind of pretend anymore that they, it's not them, right? So as it was before. And was that all something that you expected? Uh, well, I mean, we are a cybersecurity defensive company, so we, uh, frankly, in our philosophy, we, we don't care where the attack comes from. We think that's in the, it's the responsibility of law enforcement people. We can help them with some evidence if they need, but, but our goal is just to protect the assets from, from those cyber attacks, to detect as early as possible and to respond. So from this perspective, basically, uh, we, we don't kind of pay too much attention. So DOD, Mika, um, what kind of lessons do you feel that it's internalizing now that we've watched a war unfold for nine months that is the first full spectrum war that we've really been able to see? Yeah, this is a really important conflict for us in the Department of Defense to understand um, because you, what you're seeing is a cyber-capable adversary bring those capabilities to bear in the context of an armed conflict. And one of the things that we're seeing is the context of the armed conflict dwarfs the cyber impacts of that. When you think about the physical destruction relative to the cyber d disruption of what happens here, things that Russians tried to disrupt via cyber could not actually, did not have the strategic impact that they wanted, and they sought to destroy those things physically. It has had a visceral reaction or a visceral um, impact on a lot of people. When you think about, you know, cybersecurity is a risk managed exercise. And if one of the risks you are trying to manage in the context of that is armed conflict, you have to think very differently about what you are dealing with. So when you think about the cybersecurity of data centers, for example, it's not just about patching and closing those things, it is about the physical security of those data centers. It is about whether or not those data centers are within the range of Russian missiles. And Ukrainian colleagues that I had the privilege of meeting with had a very different physical and visceral reaction to data centers that were above ground than, um, than I think they would have had prior to the conflict. So I think we have to think about it very differently. But when I think about the four big categories of things that we, the Department of Defense, have to think about <coughs> in the context of armed conflict. We have to make sure that we are thinking about secure communications, government to government, um, how our communications with Ukraine have helped enable their defense through intelligence sharing and other things. How do we make sure that those networks are secure? How do we make sure that the Ukrainians are able to continue secure communications with their forces, as we've seen Russians trying to disrupt that, the Viasat hack is part of that. Um, we also now have to think about what it means for Ukrainians to be able to continue to communicate with the world. Because the ability of average Ukrainians to tell their story on TikTok, on Twitter, on Facebook, to share video of what has happened to them has denied Russia the information environment that they want to prosecute this conflict. And you can see Russia trying to take away from Ukraine the ability to control its own fate and its traffic by trying to reroute traffic through Russia as they take over territory. Um, and then the last thing is, how do we ensure that they can continue essential government function? As you look at attempts to destroy the kind of essential data that makes a country a country. Such as? Such as passport records, birth records, property records. As you see, Russification efforts. Um, happening in occupied territories. What do governments need to be able to continue to operate its essential function? 
As we think about that at the Department of Defense, those first two things are things that we have a lot of expertise in and can help countries deal with. Um, some of those other things are new to us and are part of whole of government efforts. But I think that we have to think very differently about how we think about armed conflict and cyber in light of this conflict. So of those four that you named, was mm -hmm. any of the four more surprising than the others? I think that this is really, you know, as Ole said, this is the first conflict that we're seeing where the ability of people to tell their stories um, as, as their experiences of armed conflict is very different, and the information space here is a very different environment um, than what we've seen before. Um, but I think that all of these things in their own way have, have different impacts. The other thing that I would just add that is different about this conflict um, is that the, there is a tremendous influence of non-state actors, both the private sector's assistance to Ukraine, but also individuals who have not wearing the uniform of any particular country who are um, coming to the assistance of one side or another. And I think that it will take us quite some time to figure out what exactly the impact of, the, of those non-state actors was in, at a strategic level. The all-volunteer IT Ukrainian yes. army. I, I want to come back to that, but I want to give you a chance to get in here, uh, Gary. Um, can you talk about the role of analytics and intelligence analytics in this kind of, uh, of environment? Because I think, I mean, I understand it now, but it took me a while to understand that, for example, seeing something in GitHub that belongs to a particular company is actually a real problem because the Russians can find it. Could you, could you give us, without naming companies or anything like that, sort of a specific example of, of, of the role that you're playing? Yeah, I, I think at a very simple level, security has rapidly increased to become a data problem simply because the attack surface is now so large and it spans the entire software development life cycle is, just spans the entire perimeter network. It spans everything going on within an environment. And so what has happened is you need rich data analytics just to figure out what the heck happened. And so um, in this world where data now is available across all these systems, you can then do rich analytics that then help inform what actually happened. And so when you use, you were giving examples earlier about the role that Mandiant was playing in, in Ukraine, underlying all of this is a rich data environment that's being used to determine where did the intrusion come from, what actually happened. And so, you know, what we see today, and, and one of the reasons we participated in this joint collaborative is to provide these capabilities into this environment so that people can help make those decisions. So what you're saying, it sounds like it would apply in peacetime as well, of course, right? So you have Every a Every single day, yeah. So how is it different in wartime? How does that, is it just sort of raise the urgency of it, or is there actually a different way of utilizing no, it's, it? No, it, it just raises the urgency of it. It's not a different way of using it. And I think, you know, one of the things that we recognize that, that you know, as you look at, at this event that has happened, how do private sector companies like a Splunk come together as a collaborative to create some value? Um, and it's hard to do this. Um, and I think that this is a good example where can we build an apparatus where if events happen in the future that we as an industry can come together to deliver value. And while we've had very good experience working in a private public arrangement with the US government through JCDC, I think this broader apparatus for supporting events like this is something we need to learn from. Right, and, and cyber um, defense assistance has to be part of a broader sort of basket of things. It does, and there's, no, and there's no real apparatus to do this, right? This, it, this came together through some leadership from, from some specific individuals. It, right, and people we, decided to take matters in their own hands. That's right, right. no, that's right. right. So let's talk a little bit about assumptions. I think that uh, we were all guilty of making some in the early days of the, uh, the war. We actually thought about going, the Click Here team was gonna go to Ukraine, and we were worried that if we got there, they would cut off communications, and we wouldn't be able to file. And I think most people thought the electrical grid was going to be attacked in a big way, not just kinetically, but, but from a cyber perspective. Um, so I wonder if each of you can talk a little bit about the assumptions about cyber and its role in war, what assumptions have changed now that we've had nine months of, of on-the-ground knowledge? 
and I can start with you, Mika, if you want, or if you're yeah. mid cough drop, we can. No, I okay. thank you. I, yes, I have a few cough drops. <laughs> um, um, look, I think as we look at sort of assumptions that have changed, I think there were a lot of assumptions about how much, how intense an effect Russia could deliver in Ukraine, given our history of the 2015 and earlier cyber attacks against Ukraine. Right. Um, this and was just to explain Black Matter, which attacked the Ukrainian uh, power grid, and what is it, half a million people lost power for about six hours. Yeah. And so I think we were expecting much more significant impacts than what we saw. Um, and I think it's safe to say that Russian cyber forces, as well as their traditional military forces, underperformed expectations. Um, some of that, I think, has to do with a sense of how long preparation takes in cyber. As you look at that Microsoft report and you see that they had a lot, Russians had a lot of cyber attacks and activity in that first week, but in the second week, activity really dropped off. Um, and then they come back again. What you see is, you see this sort of in the data, the fact that Russia was not prepared for the conflict to go on as long as it did. And so when they had to come back quickly, what do they come back with? Do they come back with the intensity and sophistication of attacks that might have come earlier in the conflict? As we think about cyber, um, there's a wonderful article by a Swiss researcher called The Subversive Trilemma that talks about three factors. The subversive, sorry? Trilemma. <laughs> okay. um, speed, intensity, and control. And it's these factors play off against each other. So you're all familiar with the tech, right? Good, fast, cheap, pick two. <laughs> Speed, impact, control, pick two, right? And so if you want it fast, then you're trading off between intensity of effect and control. And if you are trying to avoid spillover, say, because you're trying to avoid embroiling NATO in a conflict that you don't want them to join into because you can barely hold your own against Ukraine, um, then you might have to lower your expectations for intensity. Um, so as we think about these things, as we think about like if you want it fast, you might not get as intense an effect you want, or you might get an uncontrolled effect. Um, if you have a lot of time, you can trade off these other things. How we think about the factors that matter in cyber as an offensive tool in conflict, I think is something uh, we have to understand how those factors play against each other and when we have to make choices. Um, how we compensate for the fact that you can't have everything as fast as you want it. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Oleg? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think that there were some assumptions were wrong all the time, and uh, and the core assumption that was wrong all the time is that technology is the decisive factor in cybersecurity. Of course, technology is, is, is essentially important, but uh, you can give. Splunk to, to different people, they will have two different results with all the same data. Uh, so it's uh, it's really the question of the quality of, and capability and skills of the team, and it's uh, and it's about the alignment of the strategic cybersecurity operations uh, and and then technical cybersecurity operations and non-technical cybersecurity operations within the company. It's about the operation, uh, you know, how do you oper operationalize the cybersecurity and not just at enterprise level, uh, but also at, you know, the, to the whole supply chain. So we in Ukraine, I mean, it's great. I admire all those initiatives that currently help Ukraine provide the technology and so on. But Ukraine somehow lived all these years uh, before, 20, you know, February 24 and have been, uh, you know, s improving in cybersecurity in so many ways. And that was where it did happen. It happened at organizational level, because cybersecurity happens at organizational level. Uh, that's where you actually detect and respond. And then, and of course, you know, very often we just see the difference between between a company where the CEO has enough engagement into the cyber problems, and and vice versus when company when the CEO is completely detached right. from from cybersecurity issues. So uh, it's, uh, and I think that in, in the future as well, and we as, a, for example, as, as, as an ISSP, we always were thinking, okay, how can we help our, our clients when they don't have budget for expensive technologies, they don't have enough uh, qualified team. Uh, and so Ukrainians at all levels, both the, the, on, the, uh, on the side of the service providers and on the side of the you know, asset owners and operators, they had to be very uh, inventive and creative and created, you know, they had to create tools that uh, enabled 
early detection response even before you know some technologies arrived in the country right. and that's uh, and, and I think that this is really and cybersecurity now before now and definitely for the at least some continuous future the foreseeable future is really a matter of how do you unlock this power of, of, of computers and people working together uh, for you know for the best result and, and having the urgency not just be for the CISO or the CEO, but everybody all the way down. I mean, that was what was interesting about NAFTA gas is that you had somebody who never really probably thought about uh, cybersecurity calling a supervisor and saying, okay, they took my computer at the border. Yeah, I'll tell you that in some companies uh, in Ukraine, uh, responding to an incident, there was automatic features when the incident happens that a person is get called or received a message and, and, and there's a very automated way how the person confirms whether he did it or not. I mean, there's a lot of different ways how you do, how do you do, how, how you can do cybersecurity at an operational level without too much, you know. Tech. Uh, no, without too much investment and right. without too much cost involved. Right. It's, it's really a lot of things are, are really in the processes, at the process level, at the management level, at the governance level. And the education of, uh, Yeah, yeah. And technologies, yeah, you can, you definitely need technologies. You can't do anything about technologies, but, uh, but it's the way how you use these technologies. Uh, and how you use this data, and, how, and, and, and what's your, how deeply you go. Very quick example, if I may. So yes, I don't of course. Know if, uh, one of the uh, significant attacks against one of the telcos, not Viasat. Everyone likes to talk about Viasat, but a <laughs> uh, different one. Uh, they, uh, they have Rhymes a, with. Huh? Rhymes with. <laughs> no, no, it was public. I mean, they, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, they, <laughs> no, no, they... They, they had some public communication about it as well. Uh, it's uh, it's Ukr Telecom who, who who actually uh, operates the fixed lines and all, all all these kinds of communications, right? So uh, the internet service provider and, and fixed lines operate, including all the lines for the right. government communications. Uh, and of course, uh, many of their facilities were uh, were unoccupied territories and so on. Uh, and uh, and they faced some significant attacks. And and one of the cases, okay, they get some. Uh, notification from from Microsoft that Microsoft noticed some, you know, malicious uh, activity within the, on some of the endpoints. Uh, okay, what's next? Next, Ukr Telecom team has to respond to that, right. and it's the quality of response of this specific team with all available technologies that actually helped them to. Uh, and show, they showed tremendous resilience. The CEO was involved. He was available to. Uh, for a call day and night if you need to enforce certain decisions within the organizations because it's also technological networks, it's not just the IT networks and, uh, and, they, uh, and they were able to, you know, to prevail and uh, although the attack was quite significant, they recovered very quickly and also why? Because the team was uh, hugely mobilized, you know, people would just work day and nights and day and nights and they, uh, they didn't have any spare resources except their you know their service provider, and uh, you know so that's that's really a matter of uh, of, uh, of of the teamwork, the skills, and sure. the level of uh, managerial attention to the matter. Do you want to talk about assumptions, Gary? Say that again. Do you want to talk about assumptions and? Uh, yeah, I think just really quickly. I think yeah. the one set of assumptions going in that we anticipated more reverberation to multinational. Um, U.S. companies that had presence in Ukraine or presence broadly across Europe, I think everyone still is in high alert because no one really knows what will happen. But we assume there would be more downstream impacts on large multinationals dealing with the fact that they either had employees or operations in Ukraine and that there would be spillover and cyber events for those particular companies. You know, frankly, it's been relatively quiet, which is a good thing. But you know, I was at a dinner with CISOs the other night, and people are still on high alert. They need to be. They need to be very thoughtful about what's happening in their environments. And we don't know where this goes. I, I think we wish it was over. It's not. And I think in, in the industry, we all need to be supporting all these organizations that are dealing with this as an ongoing threat. And so. I think we had assumed it would have, there would have been more reverberation right now. I think we hope that it's not going to be, but I think that's the question of the hour is where does this go from here? 
Yeah, Dina, on that point, I think, you know, President Biden was very clear with his counterparts about issuing deterrence messaging about uh, what, how we might view attacks on U.S. and allied critical infrastructure, and I think they've taken that seriously. But that doesn't mean that we can, that that messaging is sufficient. And so the Shields Up exercise that uh, DOD, DHS, other interagency partners have been engaged in to try and make sure that industry is on high alert, that we are sharing in very novel ways the indicators of uh, adversary activity to try and help people prepare and enable better private sector defenses. Uh, this is a really um, unprecedented effort on behalf of the U.S. government at this time. Um, you know, in, in light of the threat, I do think that we are seeing what happens when when Russia is forced to make choices about how much how it allocates the cyber capacity that it has. Um, I don't think any of us know what the escalation calculus is going to be um, and at what point we might be having to really think about uh, attacks on U.S. infrastructure, but it is really important that we are taking all the steps that we can to prepare for um, the possibility of that, to make ourselves as hard and resilient a target as we can be throughout the United States. And I think we've learned a lot of really important lessons. Um, you know, NSA as part of DOD has been working with DHS very closely to try and make sure that the kind of adversary activity we see is pushed out in useful ways to industry, um, which I think is culturally very different uh, than how the NSA has been in the past. And I think is, uh, we are learning a lot about what it means for the Defense Department to engage its defend the nation mission in cyberspace and how we can better enable others uh, to defend so that we, the Defense Department, don't have to be on all of those networks. Well, also, wars have a way of focusing minds, right? So I, I want to. Can I add something? Because yeah, I just want to go to a, questions. Yeah, I think it's very important because I think we shouldn't underestimate also the, uh, the way the decision making is made by by the Russian agencies who, who wage cyber attacks or who control the, the proxy groups that wage cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, you know, let's assume the question, what would you prefer if, uh, as a as Ukrainian company and so on, you have an adversary inside your networks and they're able to, to, to read your, you know, emails, they, they have access to your, to your network, they're, they're inside, but they are stay quiet and stealthy and just do what, you know, get access to data right. or you would prefer that they trigger the culmination phase of the attack and you kick them off and so on and I think that in many cases what happened in Ukraine during this past month is that maybe somehow some somebody uh, within the Russian agencies just needed to show that they can do something and then and they and, and they sacrifice their presence in certain networks for the sake of showing that they're actually fighting Right. You know, because they also need to report to, through upward. chain of command upward, and they kind of need. So, what are you doing? You know, oh, okay, so oh, Wait here you go. So, so that's that's also, and uh, and uh, we, uh, we and there's always a chance. I mean, uh, what, when the next major security breach comes, and what's what's the next major zero day? What's the next major? So, it's it's all the questions. So it, it means that we we just need to keep going and keep you know improving our cybersecurity systems. It's, it's not over. I don't know if anybody wanted to ask a question. We have a couple. We have time for maybe one or two, but I, it's hard to see if anybody. I see a waving hand on this side, sort of. If you can, um, somebody will bring you a microphone. I hope, and uh, maybe not. Oh, there it is. Okay, if you could, if someone could raise their hand, and we'll bring you a microphone. There we go. Up here in, in front, sir. Please. Thank you. Oh. No, oh, that makes it oh, so much easier. Oh, there's people there. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Everybody stayed. Yay. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. A, a question relating to um, current escalation or, or changes in tactics of the, of the conflict right now. Given that we can see that Russia's tactics have changed to direct kinetic attacks on critical infrastructure, is it reasonable then to assume that the cyber groups will be retargeted for pre-positioning outside of Ukraine? And if so, what actions should people be taking right now to mitigate those effects? So I don't know that we can assume that that's what's going to happen. Um, 
I think that the question of what we call you know, horizontal escalation into things that are not currently this conflict, that's a, a big decision uh, for the Russian government to undertake. Um, but that said, because cyber is a risk managed exercise and it takes time to prepare, it is very important that everyone is closing all the known vulnerabilities that they have, doing the patching, doing the basics, making sure that they have resilience plans. Now, because I don't know that anyone can say with certainty what would happen next. Do you have another question? This gentleman in the uh, white shirt, uh, do you see him, sir? He's subtly wa waving his hand, but. One of the things that was mentioned earlier, but we didn't get a chance to discuss, was the very effective um, organization by the Ukrainians of tens of thousands of hacktivists around the world to target uh, Russian, Russian uh, targets. Known as and, the Ukrainian IT Army. And the IT Army of the Ukraine, and very effective use of Telegram. Could you comment on the implications of that for US national security in the future? Because as, as the Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI, commented in his testimony to Congress early in the war, it doesn't bode well for us that we have to think about not defending ourselves in the future just against foreign adversaries, but also against potentially citizens targeting the United States en masse. Cyber mercenaries, if you will. Yeah, I think this is one of the assumptions that I think those of us who work in uh, traditional you know, theories of armed conflict have to understand is different about cyber. Whereas in regular warfare, offensive capabilities are held monopoly to the state, right? You don't have a lot of non-state actors who have, you know, theater missile defense systems or theater missile systems. Um, but in cyber, you do see non-state actors who have cap uh, capability that can rival that of state actors. And so it does mean that it becomes a very complicated thing to defend against. Um, not only that, it complicates attribution uh, because then how do you engage in deterrence or response if you are not sure that the people that have attacked you are state actors or non-state actors. Um, that forces uh, a little slowdown in the cyber response process as you try to unwind that to make sure that you are not inadvertently taking a step in response against someone who didn't actually come at you in the first place. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We could talk for another half hour, but if you could please uh, thank, uh, join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.